Hi, my name's Josh. Thanks for tuning in for another episode of APTV. Today we're talking to Asif Mamon, executive chef of Delaware North. Delaware North is one of the largest hospitality companies employing 55,000 staff worldwide, generating $2.3 billion of annual sales. In Australia, Delaware North look after Melbourne, Adelaide and Perth airports, major venues such as the MCG and Marvel Stadium, as well as Asif's home ground, Melbourne Olympic Parks, which includes John Kane Arena, John Kane Arena, Rod Laver Arena, Margaret Court just over here, and your new venue centerpiece. Asif and his army of about 300 chefs cater for about 1.6 million visitors a year, including at the tennis at the Australian Open. Asif, thank you for participating in this series and for sharing your valuable insights, trends, and industry knowledge with us today. So a little bit about yourself. You are Bangladeshi. You yes. emigrated to Australia when you were a teenager? Yes, pretty much. I was 21. 21. What yeah. brought you to Australia? More importantly, how did you then become one of the most important personalities and relevant personalities in Australia as a major events chef? Look, from my childhood, like, I just wanted to explore the world. And I have few friends actually came over to Australia before. So it's like, you know, when you're young, you're a teenager, you just follow your friends. So that exactly naturally it happened. They came here and then I follow them and then I follow Single? Love. Single, yes, yes, yeah. And how did you get to work in the events industry? And Look, when grow. I came, like any others, like whoever come from overseas, the first thing you miss is your food. So I was quite like kind of homesick. I was missing my own food and pretty much every night I used to call my mom and ask her how to do this, do that. Which is Bengali cuisine? Bengali cuisine. and. Before I knew it, like, you know, I fall in love, cook my own dishes, own food. And that journey just continued and here I am today. Right. Well, your title is executive chef. Everyone knows that chefs are in the kitchen, chefs cook, they plan. What's an executive chef's role at a major events venue? And what core skill set and technical skills do you need in order to produce that role? Okay. So that's the two things like executive, then chef. So there's actually two role in one. So the executive bit I, I explained to you. So I have to do a lot of planning, budget, concept, and I have to interact with a lot of people like sales, marketing, PR, you know, so all sort of like office work that I need to maintain and collaborate with a lot of people. So that's the executive bit. And then also like I need to menu design and test all my recipes. So then I'm in the kitchen and leading the team. So that's become executive chef. Uh, to become an executive chef, look, it's based on you need a uh, few more year experience. Like uh, I've been in this industry almost 22 years, you know, so it's, it's and you have to have all sort of You've learned a lot. Over the past couple of years and throughout COVID, hospitality industry in particular has been disrupted. Now that we're coming to the end of that and we're going through some stability, it seems like Melbourne Olympic Park has had quite a bit of success with the $970 million renovation and centerpiece expansion. What challenges did you face during that time? And are they still relevant? Are they still challenges for you in your industry? Or have you managed to overcome them? Look, the, the challenges, as, as you mentioned, like we, we face few challenges is not only us, the whole industry, but the company like Dollar or not, like we was uh, in a way pretty planned. We had a vision because uh, the building behind us centerpiece we was actually working on it that we need to develop a menu and when we coming other side of the COVID that we need to launch this menu. So we successfully managed to keep our core team and like we just continue like even like I did many days like you know chef it doesn't exist working from home but I actually developed a lot of my recipes and work when I was at home and same for my team like I tried to engage them when they're at home we delegate different responsibilities so and then we connect once or twice a week that's how i managed to keep the core team and in in terms of like when we expanding when we came to the ground we have different partners that we they really help us to manage that and and i, I think we have done it very successfully and in terms of the challenges that you faced over that time obviously events were down staff were not able to come in on a regular basis do those challenges still exist or have we moved no, on from those? It, it, no, I think we moved on, yeah, because it's pretty much the whole world, you know, 
obviously thanks to the vaccines like everybody gaining some confidence and everything pretty much our industry is coming back very very strongly Melbourne sporting event so Melbourne is the sporting capital now that the events are coming back in what does that mean for Australia what does that mean for Melbourne in general we've got you know, the uh, Melbourne Cup coming up soon, we've got cricket, we've got the Australian Open, of course. How do you see that impacting Melbourne now that we're bouncing back and bringing all of these events back into full swing? Look, even though before COVID, like as our, the people in our industry, we always say we actually probably the heart of the Victorian economy because more or less all these events draw a lot of people, not only from Melbourne, from international, so and and you will agree with me that throughout this like last two years that everybody agreed because our when our industry was down that impacted a lot of other industries so in that perspective like i'm very optimistic especially for australian open that last two years we missed a lot of international guests that we couldn't really look after them entertain them and this year obviously the border is open and we're expecting that everybody will come and except our, for nadal so, yeah, I cannot comment on that, but yeah, like, you know, a lot of people will be hoping that we can, you know, put our best show. Yeah. So you're forecasting tennis to be as it was in 2018, 19? Uh, even bigger. Really? Like, yeah. Yeah. We're expecting daily between 85 to 100,000 people will come through the door. And from a resources and a procurement and logistics perspective? Look, I always no problem say, with that? No, I always say that, like, you know, we never stop working for AO, Australian Open. Soon we finish, we start again. Debrief, planning, it's, we couldn't do two Australian Open in one year because the intensity, as I mentioned, looking after pretty much 100,000 people for 14 days, that's very challenging, but manageable because we have a very good process in place and that's how we execute every year. And so you touched on transport in Australia being, or Melbourne being the sporting capital. So major transport, airports and train stations, they're all central to the domestic and international travel. We've got about two and a half million people traveling through Melbourne airport every month. How are Delaware North looking after the requirements at Melbourne airport and what changes have they imp implemented as a result of you know, passengers fluctuating and now coming back to the pre-pandemic levels almost, with maybe some different requirements and needs. Look, in, in our business, we have scope scaling up, scale, scaling down. And as a, like Delaware North is a huge uh, company, we, we have ability to, you know, engage with our local partner and bring something new. Because when people, as you touched on, that a lot of national and international people when coming through Melbourne Airport. So we try to showcase what Melbourne has to offer. Uh, I can give you an example, one of our local idols, Scott Pickett, we have, we have engaged with him. So we had uh, Piccadilly, right, uh, in Qantas, yeah. uh, Domestic Airport. So like we try to, you know, engage our local heroes and local producer and put it just at, at the front that people passing through Melbourne, they can get a taste of Melbourne. So you're finding more people are looking for a localized and a experience led um, connection as opposed to something that's just more generic and a national brand, but something that's more about Melbourne, something that's more about a personality look, and curated? Look, it, it, it started, I think, if you go back 10 years ago, I'm not saying people wasn't health conscious or anything, but we have a lot of resources. People have the ability to dip into a lot of resources and they want to know, okay, what, like how I'm, if I'm having a coffee, that's the be best coffee or how it's been sourced. That uh, sustainability or self-awareness it's just naturally grow over the years and and that's why yes I, like there's a demand for it that you engage your local producer the good producer and pretty much a bit of background and story that we what we offer it so you don't guests. need to go out to a venue to get that experience but rather wherever you travel wherever you go you have the ability to pick up and to capture that experience that, that's the aim that's yeah. that's our focus so touching on scott pickett and celebrity chefs in the events industry, we saw celebrity chefs being featured at events regularly. We don't see that anymore. We haven't seen that over the last couple of years. Do you have any thoughts on that? And do you think that's something that's relevant and will come back at all? I think so. Look, sometimes uh, 
you need that to engage and showcase, as I mentioned to you before, that our local heroes, who's our next food idol, especially this is very important for young chefs. So they have, it's like a motivation. A platform almost, a platform to, almost to, to reach there. It, 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 it's kind of both way that you, you promoting a local brand or local chef, same time you're actually motivating a lot of ten thousands of other chefs that on the pipeline that they you pretty much you 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 giving them a dream that hey if you work hard and just stick to what you're doing and then one day maybe so you're the next who's a good example of someone that's done that at an event and you know pulled off a bit of a pr stunt or being able to accelerate themselves from attending events hosting events being involved in that industry me yeah. <laughs> so when are you coming to cook <laughs> always Always I'm cooking, you know, I'm cooking pretty much uh, whenever my day off. I always cook at home. I, I do a lot of tasting uh, during my work time at workplace. So it's... So you run the kitchen at home? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Does like, your wife clean the dishes? No. <laughs> Dishwasher. Dishwasher. Being an executive chef, you must hear and see a lot of trends coming from overseas. And you've got to be at the forefront of these trends, introducing them maybe six or nine months out to your menus. What are the biggest trends coming in and what's your prediction for the trends in 2023? I think a bit of everything because, you know, there was a time people went for Mexican. There was a time Japanese because obviously, like thanks to COVID, people, we've been locked up for a long time. I think people just want to go out and celebrate and enjoy the moment with any good food, any good cuisine. And I don't see it's gonna go away or a new trend will pop up at least another year or two. So strongly this year and next year, like, and Melbourne is the, you know, is the food hub. You know, we are the capital of food and we extremely privileged that it's multicultural and we have good produce pretty much, not only locally, some international good produce that we, we have access to. And that's why I won't limit anyone or any cuisine because as a chef, you know, I like good food. And uh, whenever I have the opportunity to involve or influence in my cooking, you know, I just, you know, bring it. The Is that a bit of a cop out though? Surely there's got to be something that's catching your attention, something that's, you know, look, I'm really married. shouting out, maybe something from overseas. Yeah, look, I'm married to Korean. I'm a Bangladeshi. Uh, my last job in uh, was Nobu. Uh, I started my career in a French cuisine with Philippe Michel. So, uh, like but before you know you know you get an influence of all those multicultural flavor into my dish and then bring it all together and bring it all one. together but i'm very conscious like when i bring it together like it's not overlapping or maybe not coming as a bowl that you're not sometimes it's lost in the translation mm. that you're not feeling what it is exactly and finally chef before we let you go we've heard all heard about the stories about the celebrity tennis players who have their specialist diets and only need certain things Who's the pickiest player you've had to cater for? And if you're not comfortable saying, at least tell us what their requirements and their dietary needs were. Look, but we want the name. Unfortunately, I cannot tell you the name, but it's, I wouldn't say the picky because certain players, they have different needs. Like if you're going to gym, probably obviously your body, or if I compare my body, will have all different needs. So they have their dietitian, they have their coach, they set certain target for them and they need to strictly maintain that. So in order to maintain that, if you want to call it picky, then they need to be because they're all competing and it's a serious event and, and everybody have one aim, which is they want to win this event. It's not only about the prize money or anything because it's prestige. Because that's how you go. Like if Australian Open, one of the you know four uh, like Grand Slam, this is probably one of the biggest one. So they are very competitive and they're very, very health conscious and they're very, very calculative that uh, you know, one match can be going for four or five hours and, uh, you know, they easily lose three to four kilos in one game. So my son's a great tennis player. If he makes it to his Australian Open, you'll do a kosher meal for him. 100%. 100%. Right. Done.